Yeah, there we You're go. Good? Yeah, that's perfect. If you want to go back to the the, the first one, the, the first one, and yeah, maybe just so people can note down the Chevelo name and the, and the ticker symbol. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Mark. So, um, what we're going to discuss about is a French company which is called uh, Gevlo, and its ticker symbol is ALGEV. It's uh, why do you have AL? It's because basically you have two fixings to, if you want to acquire sell shares of, of that company. It's at 11 30 and 4 30 French time. So, that's why you've got the IL. It's a different two, only two fixings per day. So, um, uh, what's Jevlo? What does uh, why do why are we going to speak about Jevlo? What do they do? What well, the interesting point with Jevlo is, first of all, it's uh, it's was created in 1820. So, in 2020, it celebrated its 200th anniversary. And initially, it was a maker of ammunition, ammunition for, for weapons. So, it has a uh, all history initially was a builder of, uh, of munitions. Then it um, slowly but surely transitioned to to other businesses, and uh, the main business now, uh, which we have, is called uh, is their business to build pumps, uh, which you can on see on the slide. You have an illustration. Um, it's uh, pumps which you can use in the oil industry, agricultural industry. Uh, and uh, in the industry in general. What do these pumps do? Basically, uh, they enable you to get some petrol out and their strength is with these, with their technology, you can go further, deeper than other pumps. And that's why they have um, uh, a unique positioning as far as pumps are concerned. So that's, that's the slide to give you more an illustration of what the pumps look like. And uh, their competitive advantage is really on that point is that um, they, with these pumps, you can go further down when you're looking for petrol. Uh, basically, they're aiming for non-conventional uh, petrol uh, uh, sources. And if not in the industrial on our, or food business, the, the aim is the same, is that you're, you're speaking about liquids which are quite dense, quite heavy. So you need special pumps and they're very good at that. And uh, that's, that's why they have uh, petrol, agriculture, and uh, industry. In that order of importance to petrol, more or less represent 50 to 60% of, of their business. Um, when we go to the next slide, it, so what's their business? Now their business is building and selling pumps. So you've got two types of technology of pumps which for which they're really famous for is uh, the Moano pumps. And the Moano pumps are been there for a very long time. It's a very good technology. It's been created by an engineer and it's a unique technology. Um, you will see that there's a long history about it. So it's something which is really recognized. And the Vulcan pumps is another approach to on how they can develop these different pumps for the different industries. More or less, uh, when, uh, when I saw the, the management at the General Assembly, because uh, we'll come back to that later, it's a very discreet company. They don't like... Uh, they only publish the semi-annual semi report and annual report. And they, you can only, if you want to see them, it's only during the shareholders uh, annual meeting. So they like to be discreet. And uh, I've been going there for the, like five years before COVID, of course. And that's how you get to know the management. And it was a very good surprise when I got, got to see them because uh, once you're there, on the contrary, you can ask as many questions as you want and they'll answer them and then also to them very frankly with no no restriction and they'll they'll accept all all the questions so uh, coming back to their products to make it simple their products are what i can be described in the following way the quality of their products you can find better but it's much more expensive so basically you have a very good product the the, um, the reputation is done the technology has been there for ages there's no question about how good their products are they're in a niche. Uh, what you have to understand by that, they, um, they focus, uh, their pumps are very good for a certain type of business. They're not, um, they're really focused on one area of business. They don't have a generic general position. They're, they're not aiming all the type of petrol companies. They're aiming for certain companies who are aiming for a certain type of petrol and that's what they do. And they're not gonna deviate from this approach. Um, in, in other words, uh, it's like the shovel seller for the gold hunters because you know everybody's uh, looking for petrol, especially in Canada and America where they're, they're very well positioned. 
And uh, that's why even if the petrol price is high or low, they're always selling, they're always selling pumps. So as I said, the clients, who are the clients? Well, it's the petrol industry, agro for the food industry and the industrial area in general. Always in the same, you see the common point is uh, that basically what they do is that they ensure the transfer of solid liquids, uh, dense liquids, and uh, for which either they, there's a risk of explosion or it's uh, for health issues. You have to be, you have to have very good pumps with a very clean and ensure good transition. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, what has been going on for the last couple of years is that they've been refocused in on the pumps business. Initially, Gevlo was a company which had three businesses. They had pumps, a mechanic business, and an extrusion business. Uh, the mechanic business was making small parts, specific car, uh, parts for cars, and it was a historical um, business for them. To it was, was, was with them for the, at least 100 years. And uh, well, finally, they decided, decided to sell it because it was a very small business, wasn't making a lot of money, wasn't losing money, but wasn't making a high profit, and they managed to sell it in 2014 for a very small amount, but it was the, the beginning of a transition because you had the, the problem with Jevlo was before it was a holding. Now you with three activities. So they got rid of one in 2014 because it was a small business. And in 2017, they sold the extrusion business. To put it simply, extrusion business is like a, a supply of a car maker. They did, the, they did the certain parts for car makers. And they sold it in 2017 for 24 million euros. And uh, basically, I remember this really well, is that when I went to the shareholders uh, meeting, uh, the, it was one or two months before uh, he sold this company, uh, I asked him, well, what are you going to do with this company? It's cyclical, uh, it's capex heavy. I mean, you're not a leader. What are you going to do about it? And are you going to sell it? And his answer was, Basically, if it were only me, I would sell it. And what happened was that two months later, well, he effectively sold it. Um, because basically he says he doesn't like uh, CapEx heavy businesses. He doesn't like it cyclical. And he understood he didn't have a competitive advantage. To illustrate another very important uh, point with Jiva, which explains also why they have a rock solid balance sheet is that in, um, uh, they managed to sell in 2016, 2017, a company which is called Kudu. Kudu was one of their subsidiaries, which was a very, had a, just a, one small line in their annual report. Uh, and it did, had sales of 102 million euros and barely did a net profit of 1 million euros. But what happened is that they managed, to put it simply, to sell, to sell the company to Schlumberger for 168 million euros, which is a massive price for such uh, uh, an entity who wasn't that profitable. My understanding is, and we can read between the lines when they explain this to us, is that Schlumberger thought that when they were buying a Kudu, that they were buying both the distribution and the technology. Uh, but in fact, they were, no, they were only buying the distribution network in uh, Northern America, be it Canada or America. So in fact, they really managed to sell a very, uh, at a very good price, just a distribution company. For Schlumberger, it, it was a loss of money. It was, it's not that much money, so it's no big deal, but it was a lot of money for Gevlo and who showed us how good they are at selling when the price is definitely very good. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, we can see that um, lots of things have changed since 2015 because there's a new CEO. Who's the new CEO? Well, it's very simple. He's the son of the previous CEO who succeeded his father to his father who, who died in, at the end of 2014. So he took over in 215 and clearly he's imposed a new dynamic. And uh, what's important to note is that he's a young CEO. He's, uh, he's in his 40s, early 40s. So uh, he's got a long runway and uh, he's a bit like the Elkman at uh, Exo Holdings. So you've got a manager who's young, who's very focused on capital allocation because we'll be seeing that lots of things happen since he's been, uh, since he's taken over. And he's, in, our, in my opinion, he's taking the right decisions, moving in the right direction and uh, simplifying the company. 
So he initiated the sale of the mechanic business as he doesn't like a business which is cyclical and capex heavy. He also sold the extrusion. So he sold all the businesses were, which were capex heavy or were not significant, significant and didn't, we didn't have any competitive advantage. He stepped up the rhythm of buybacks of uh, repurchase of shares. Uh, he bought for 10.9 10 million euros and 10.2 million euros in 2015, 2018. And what's interesting is the maximum price he paid for was 200 euros. Uh, and I think uh, had he been able to buy more, he would have bought more. Uh, for an illustration, uh, now the price of the share is at 180 euros. So basically, the current price you're buying at a lower price than what he accepted to pay to buy out um, uh, an investor. What's also interesting with him is that when you go to his shareholder meetings is that he's very, uh, he's very conservative. He's always downplaying what's going on. I mean, if you listen to the perspectives of his, at the end of it, for the next year at each of his annual uh, the shareholder meetings, it's always, oh, it's gonna be difficult. We never know. And in general, there was, do very well in general. They more or less that the pumps business is more way, more or less has sales with, which increased three or four percent by year, and he had not he acknowledges that he can do much better than that. And uh, he's been very clear uh, once that they can do much better. That they were a bit taking it a bit too easy for a long time, and now now he wants to speed up. So that's uh, that's that's focus on the seal because lots of things have been going on since he's arrived. So what has he been doing recently as far as the, the acquisition strategy is concerned? Well, basically he's just rebuilding Kudu and doing bolt on acquisitions. Um, basically he bought uh, this year and last year, two companies who, who were based in Canada and a bit in America, but especially Canada, which are Europump, uh, which he bought back from Halliburton and he managed to buy it with a bad will. So basically, to put it to illustrate it, he bought it for one, 1. 1.2 million euros, but uh, he had a bad will of 2 million. So he really did a, a good buy on that one. And Kuga is the same thing. Uh, he, what he did is that he bought it, uh, it, well, it was a bit of a down, downturn. And um, of course, with the crisis, uh, it helped him to not pay the earn out fee he was supposed to pay. So he's, he's very good at buying uh, companies. And he's basically what he's doing, he's rebuilding uh, the distribution network in uh, Canada. Um, so he's redoing a kudu in, a, in another way, uh, but a less, less expensive price than what he sold to Schlumberger. He also acquired a couple of years ago, uh, a small company in Italy, uh, which does pumps too. Uh, it's called uh, Sidex SRL. It's a small company, uh, but it's um, very profitable. And uh, more or less, um, EBITDA margins of 20%. Small company, but EBITDA margin of 20%. He, he only has 60% of the company because the, the founding members of the company still wanted to be operational. I said, okay. And I asked him the question, why didn't you buy everything out or a bit less? Well, I said, they wanted to keep on working and uh, their know-how and their competitive advantage is linked to them. So I was willing to accept to let them have still 40%. In any case, we have the majority. And he really likes the technology, and it's all also always in um still in the um, the pump sector. Um, now we can move on to why would we say it's um it's a special situation? Um, well, many things have been going on recently, but uh, what you have to know is that the top two shareholders are the holdings of the founding families of Jevlo. And of course, the son is at the head of the most important holding, which just crossed over the threshold of 50% of the holding of Jevlo. And another branch of the family has 9%. They have a derogation to not launch a tender off on the whole company because you can get that in France as long as you explain what's going on. And of course, uh, since he's been there, he's been benefiting naturally from the buybacks because it's a company which buybacks comp uh, shares, but they cancel them. So it's just that they don't keep them. They really cancel them. In a, in, it's a way to say they won't be using them to buy other companies later. What's been going on recently is that, uh, unfortunately, one of the family members who was a longtime administrator died uh, during the summer of 2020. 
uh, which had for consequence well that uh, succession was uh, managed and uh, uh, the CEO as, as well as the other family members got uh, additional shares from her. This is why he crossed over the threshold of 50%. And the consequence of this is that they uh, very recently, one month ago, uh, two months max, uh, signed uh, an agreement to say that both holdings will at least keep their shares for another two years. Um, so two years is good but it's not that much and many things can go on in 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 in, in the near future um and we'll be seeing that in a as we go by but it's uh in other words it's just, it's just a, it gives even more importance to the actual ceo who is really good and given a good direction to the company um there's a specificity uh, which you, we have to um, understand with uh, Gevlo is that they have um, important advance on contracts and it's, it's always an issue to know how you're going to treat uh, these advance on contracts. It's never easy because some would say you have to deduce it from the, um, from the cash positions. And, uh, but uh, I have a tendency to have a more uh, a different approach for, for a simple reason. We are, uh, when we're at, um, at the General Assembly, we ask, why, how do you manage to get all these uh, advance on contracts? And basically, the answer is very simple. It's historical terms of contract. It's because we want to make sure we get paid. So we always uh, make sure we get paid in advance. For certain clients, they get everything paid, uh, paid straight away even if they will only uh, deliver the products later. Or in other ones, they get really, um, the terms of the contract really precise, at least stay when they will get paid. So they, it's a historical terms of contract. They've always done this like that and the clients are not afraid to uh, pay in advance. So this is a reason I don't necessarily like to deduce these amounts from the, uh, cash position because in my opinion it's a competitive advantage but in any case if we don't deduce it you will see uh, valuation is ridiculous um that's like that we'll go to the to the next uh, uh slide which is more about the valuation of this company uh market cap is at 138 million uh, euros but if you calculate the enterprise value without adjusting the advance uh, uh, payments on contracts, you would have a negative enterprise value. I mean, you're paid to be an owner of the company. If, if you adjust for the advanced contracts, you still end up with an EV of uh, 36 million euros for sales of 103.7 million euros in 2019. 2020, the numbers went down to 96, 95 million euros, but um, considering that uh, 2020, like all the companies, was a one-off year, and they still managed to be profitable in uh, 2020. But so you've got an EV with the adjustment of 36 million euros for a company who generally does 103 million euros of sales, and you'll see that they, they, they're really profitable. We'll see that later. And more or less, they have um, a bit of a margin of, in 2019 of 14%. So, I mean... I think it's worth uh, it's worth much more than 36 million euros. Uh, they have a rock solid balance sheet. So they have a net cash position of 151.9 million euros if you don't uh, adjust for the advancing contracts or 100 million, 100.8 million euros with the advance on contract adjustment. Where does all this cash come from? Well, it's quite easy. They got it from uh, selling uh, Kudu, especially, and uh, the previous uh, the previous entities, but especially from Kudu, and uh, we'll see too. But uh, just to put a bit of uh, there's an initial part to they have a bit of real estate which they own indirect, and it's a bit of a hidden asset. Nobody, uh, you can add an additional two million euros which are in hidden uh, assets in um, real estate which are in a very good area in Paris. And uh, we'll be coming back to that because they have this historically and sometimes they're speaking of developing this, uh, this part of the business. Um, for the valuation metrics, um, 
as I said, uh, EV, EV on EV EBITDA is negative without the adjustment. And if you adjust it, it's 2.7 with uh, the EBITDA of 2019. Of course, it would be higher with 220, but we still had more or less 8 million euros of uh, EBITDA in 220. It, it remained profitable in 220 and 221. There's no doubt that it will rebound, as you also know, that the price of petrol came back up after a difficult year. So um, there's no, no worries about coming back to back to normal profitability, and especially with a manager who's focusing on improving this uh, profitability. Price to book value is uh, 0 0.7. Ross, uh, return on invested capital, sorry, that's in French, but return on invested capital is 8.5%, but remember they have a, a massive cash, a net cash position and some investment in real estate, which tends to not give a, a, a favorable uh, ratio to, on this uh, metric. Moving on, uh, capital allocation. Um, what has the, the CEO done? Basically, it's been consistently share, uh, buying back shares with the highest price as 200 euros. But what you have to understand, he's not buying every year, but he's trying to buy big blocks when they are made available and he will buy them if the price is right. More or less, uh, my understanding here is that he, he wasn't able to buy back shares during the last year because of the, um, uh, of the unfortunate death of one of the family members. And the time that everything gets set up uh, and reorganized, uh, I suspect he'll start buying back shares in the, um, in the second semester of this year because the price is lower than the price he was willing to pay two, three years ago when we in a, a normal year outside of, um, of the impact of the coronavirus. Um, why is he doing? Dividend has historically been at 1.8 euros uh, per year. He just increased it to two euros. It's a possible point we'll see later, but it's probable he could increase it. And of course, he's done growth acquisitions he's done before. Um, concerning why is it so so cheap? Basically, it's not followed. Uh, there's no coverage and there's no willingness of the company to communicate more. Historically, it was known for being a holding with three entities and it only has one business now. And it's linked to pen petrol, yet uh, we've seen that it still managed to be highly profitable even in a difficult petrol environment. And basically, there's also an institutional investor, a big one, who's been a historical shareholder who is capping the price because he's been trying to get out for the last two, three years. And we suspect, uh, I, I think he, it will nearly be seen the end of this uh, capping as there's two other institutional investors who are buying the shares. And the real, real estate investments, well, some people are scared about that because they keep saying they're trying to improve, uh, buy more uh, real estate. And in fact, the reality is they're very disciplined. And they told me many times that they weren't satisfied with the prices they were seeing on the real estate market in Paris. So they, wouldn't, they were just not buying. So what's the investment thesis? It's um, an excellent and young capital allocator. Lots of buybacks solely focused now on one business, which is their best business where they have a competitive advantage. And maybe there will be more buybacks. I think it will be the case in, uh, starting uh, after June, July. Will there be a special dividend? Possible too, uh, because with the family reorganization, it could be something which could happen. Or there could be additional acquisitions to amplify the competitive advantage they have. The risks, uh, well, a poor allocation of, of the cash. Of course, he's got all this cash. Will we be sure he will use it wisely? In my opinion, I think, yes, he's proven it in the past and he's very conservative, he's very careful. The price of petrol remains low. So if the price of petrol remains low, it's more difficult for their clients. But as we know, price of petrol goes up and down. And even when it was down, he was still selling his pumps because you need pumps, you need their pumps. And it's not a very uh, CSI compliant business. So sometimes institutional investors won't invest in that type of company because it's, it doesn't have a, an interesting, uh, well, it's, it's not compliant to CSR uh, constraints. And uh, well, thanks for listening. And if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate. Um, I'll see if there's some questions. Um, there are qu quite a few, Jeremy, but uh, some you I think you've kind of answered just in those last two or slides. And uh, maybe just yes, okay. one on protections for minority shareholders in France against you know being bought out at 
low prices are a are a squeeze out scenario. Um, oh, um, uh, there's still enough um, uh, ownership which is outside of family control. Was like uh, uh, as we've seen, there's like they have more or less sixty percent, and the rules in France have changed slightly, but we're still comfortable with it uh, because the rule is you have to have both ninety percent. Um, uh, sorry, either you, um, you have to have both 90% of the capital and 90% of the voting rights. We're very far from that for Gevlo. And to be honest, uh, I've seen the manager many times at the shareholding meeting. He's not there. To, he respects minority interests. He, he, won't, he won't do a bad, bad, he won't treat badly minority shareholders. It's not his style. To be honest, I've seen him. He's, uh, he's honest. I've seen him for five years. He's not. It's not his willingness to have minority uh, shareholders be not respected. No, no risk on that point. Yeah. Okay. And then maybe we can combine two questions into one. Um, how exposed is the business to competitors or technological change? And maybe just talk about, it, you know, the level of R and D that they need to put into the pumps business themselves. Uh, maybe if you could just expand on that as the second part. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it's a good question. They, um, Kelly, he said he wanted to pick up uh, the investments in R and D. He wasn't satisfied. Uh, to be honest, he said we, we we slacked. We were slacking for a couple of years. So now I've asked everyone to accelerate. Um, he's he's. I think more or less they. You know, they don't uh, immobilize the R and D. They put in expensive uh, expenses. Sorry. So uh, I would say they more or less spend uh, 1 million euros a year in R&D. We don't have the exact number, but he's really conscious about that. And to be honest, the technology of the Moano pumps is really uh, unique and it's been there for ages. He knows he has to keep working on this mode. So I'm, I'm not really worried about that. As, as I said, he's really focused, focused on some niche. He's not a general, uh, just a pump. A seller or producer of pump which can apply to everything he's very he's on very specific markets and not not many people try and come on his market the interesting point was Schlumberger trying to buy a kudu thinking they were buying the technology and they didn't and then in terms of the overall size of the market for the pumps business are they the leader in that space um, and you know how much have they space to grow Okay, that's a good question to which I don't have an answer because he, um, honestly, he won't say exactly uh, their competitive position, but he considers to be a leader in their niche, but he would like to expand a bit their market and, and he knows he can do much better in, uh, clearly, I think he's aiming for higher growth uh, levels. I mean, he's not aiming just for three or 4% per year. You have to know uh, if it can help that a long, long time ago, because you'll understand what I'll say, which country it concerned, they had very good positions in a country which is called Venezuela. And uh, well, the uh, political situation has been difficult for a couple of years and they lost a big client, but honestly, they're getting back there slowly. So if this market reopens, they can get another dynamic starting. And to be honest, in the business they are, uh, increasing sales to three or 4% per year is, is nice. Remember, it's very CapEx light. Uh, they don't have, a, they don't need big factories. It's really CapEx light. So uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the market competition uh, is, um, is there, but they know it's there. They know they have to improve their products. And as for the market, you know, it's, it's most of the business comes from the petrol, but year in year out uh, it improved by three four percent and the and the, the clients in the agricultural and industrial business are very sticky uh once they're in it they're, it's it's over yeah okay jeremy thank you very much we'll leave it there